So welcome in this um, session on uh, the topic uh, sustainable uh, fashion, no longer just another option. So this is an activity that is proposed uh, in the framework of our uh, collaboration with the Instituto Cervantes. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, being uh, with us to uh, discuss this uh, very important topic. Uh, I'm sure that our guests will tell us that fashion is an industry that has a, a really a huge importance at the scale of the world. And this is a place where really we can uh, make a difference. But I will not tell you more uh, and take the risk uh, to discover a bit what would be said. And I will immediately uh, leave the floor uh, on behalf of the European School of Administration and of the head of the school, Ana Ituriaga, to um, Gonzalo del Puerto uh, from Instituto Cervantes. Gonzalo, please. Thank you very much, Yves. It's very kind of you and uh, a warm welcome to everyone uh, to today's event, Sustainable Fashion, No Longer Just Another Option. On behalf of the Instituto Cervantes in Brussels and it, uh, its, its director, Ana uh, Vasquez Barrado, who uh, unfortunately has been incapable of being uh, today with us to address these welcoming words on behalf of the Institute that she would have wished Today's uh, roundtable, as you know, brings to uh, a close uh, the, of the closing moment of the collaboration that we have established with the European School of Manage uh, Management within the, the framework of the Silk Now project, in which the Institute has been able to collaborate with the headquarters of our own institution in Madrid, as well as with uh, Cervantes' centers in uh, Lyon, uh, Palermo, uh, Manchester, and Varsa, and, and of course, uh, with the University of Valencia. To all our colleagues involved in these organizations uh, and in, within the framework of the project, I would like to give a very warm thank you. We uh, also thank once again the European School of Management for its formidable partnership, which makes possible a line of joint cultural action of the utmost importance to us. We would particularly like to thank Anna Ituriaga, Blanca Claramun, and of course today to Yves Kailin, who uh, is, is, is representing the institution today. Uh, and uh, well, Anna and uh, Blanca weren't uh, as well, not able to be with us today, uh, but this is a very warm uh, thank you for the brilliant job you have been doing with us. And this is a very nice proof of that. Uh, the last occasion, the 24th June, uh, at this interesting meeting, Europe is woven in silk. And of course, finally, many thanks to all of you for participating in the meeting today. With further ado, allow me to say a few words about Jorge Sebastián Lozano, who will be moderating the meeting in a minute. Jorge Sebastián Lozano is an associate professor uh, in the Department of History of Art uh, at the University of Valencia. His training was developed in the University of Valencia itself and at the Higher Council for uh, Scientific Research, uh, Spain, uh, and at Columbia University. In 2017 and 2018, he has been a researcher at the Real Colegio Complutense and at Harvard University. He devote, as he devoted his uh, doctoral thesis to the visual representation of, of gender in the Hispanic monarchy of the modern age. And more recently, he has devoted special attention to the painter Sophonis van Wissola, collaborating on the catalog of the exhibition dedicated to the painter at the Prado Museum in 2019. At the same time, he has organized numerous exhibitions and conferences uh, on contemporary art, mainly at the Fundación Mainel. She has been also involved in digital initiative for the study and dissemination of art. Since 2018, uh, he is a technical manager of SIGNOW, a research project funded by the European Commission within the Horizon 2002 and program. So with no further ado, Jorge, please take the floor and thank you once again to all of you. Thank you, Gonzalo. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, thank you particularly as well today for the European School of Administration 
that is hosting this event and that has uh, led a collaboration these last months preparing this event and the previous one. Uh, on occasion of the, well, let's say last uh, events uh, related to the Silk Now project, uh, a research uh, project that, as Gonzalo already mentioned, is, is about to finish and had, that has been, funded, but has been found, funded by the H2020 program from the European Commission. So we're glad here today to bring what we consider an interesting and probably quite new perspective on the issue of uh, sustainability. Our project brings together uh, computer scientists and uh, heritage professionals, historians, art historians, researchers, and, uh, but we are very much aware that silk is not something that only belongs, let's say, to a golden past, to an age of uh, queens and kings and princes. Uh, silk is very much alive, and silk is at the very heart of the, of the creative industries, of the lives and the economies of some parts of Europe, and also the same happens worldwide. And this led us to this has led us to a number of collaboration with uh, professionals from the creative industries, and we were thinking that uh, it was important to bring this perspective of uh, sustainability to an industry that has really a absolute global importance, but has also important, let's say, consequences, not just on the livelihoods, but also on the environment for many many communities. At the same time, we consider that sustainability, well, it's very common to speak about the three dimensions of uh, sustainability. We historians like to also talk about the fourth dimension of sustainability, which is cultural sustainability. It, it really needs, we really need to bring this into the mainstream, bring this into the you know, general perception of the public since no, we think that no sustainability work is possible without some kind of uh, implications, cultural implications. Sustainability doesn't happen in the void. Sustainability happens within communities, within lives of, of people. And in that regard, culture plays a key role. So that's in a very <laughs> brief manner, the, the panorama, the, the outlook for today's conversation. And uh, let me just begin by also expressing our gratitude to our speakers today. And uh, I, I'm proud to say that we have today here a really global session. Our audience may not yet know, but we have speakers here in Valencia. That's my colleague, Margaitan. But we also have speakers from Washington, D.C., from the EU, the East Coast, where it must be really early in the morning, but we won't get into that at this moment. And we also have speakers uh, from Australia, from Eastern Australia, but it must be really, really late in the night, so we won't get that into that either. So thank you. Thank you very much. Heartfelt thanks for all of you for participating here today. And so I will just uh, now introduce all our three speakers and then they can, uh, I will leave the floor to them so that they can give their presentations. Of course, we will have, after the questions, we will have some, after the presentations, we will have some, uh, of course, um, issues to comment among, among them and with me as well. And of course, as you know, you can at any time leave your questions in the Q&A box. And we will, of course, propose the questions to them once, uh, once the, the presentations are, are over. So let me now introduce uh, our first speaker today, who will be Eda Hammer from Andres Runways. Eda um, advocates for a sustainable, ethical, and inclusive fashion industry. For 10 years, she has built a movement to educate and inspire people to make sustainable wardrobe choices. She co-founded Andres Runways in 2011, which grew to become Australia's leading sustainable fashion run runway show. Uh, it's exhibited in Australian cities, Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. And these events engage more than 50,000 50, people every year to celebrate forward-thinking fashion designers from around the world. It showcases from swimwear to couture. Andres, in this regard, broadens people's awareness to a world that respects garment makers and the environment. In 2014, Eda launched an annual magazine on the future of fashion, the Naked Mag. It features contributors from over 10 countries and it brings a global perspective to local Australian markets. 
advocating for diversity, respect, equity, sustainability, and smart textiles in the fashion industry. The Naked Mag empowers its readership to make better choices for the planet and our future generations. In September 2016, Eda was named a United Nations Young Leader for the Sustainable Development Goals for her work leading change in the fashion industry. She also became the QLD Young Achiever of the Year in 2017 and made the Forbes 30 under 30 Asia list in 2018. So, Eda, um, thank you very much. Uh, Tere Gonzalez, uh, she's a create Tere Gonzalez Garcia. She's a creative communicator, social entrepreneur, and cultural engineer, with an international career involving advocacy, program management, and communication strategies. She currently works at the World Bank Group, supporting global efforts to advance gender equality and the economic inclusion of underserved groups, such as LGBTQI communities and persons with disabilities. Tere has previously worked at the United Nations Foundation, the Organization of American States, and the Dalbert Group, developing programs and campaigns to advance gender equality, youth entrepreneurship, and sustainable development at large. She has extensive field work experience with minorities and mar marginalized communities, and is the co-founder of two nonprofit organizations in Mexico, her original country, focused on issues ranging from social justice to sustainable and affordable energy. She was appointed as one of the first United Nations Young Leaders for the Sustainable Development Goals in recognition of her work for sustainable development around the world. And then Mar Gaitan, she's a research assistant for the Silk Now project. She's an art historian, a master's in cultural heritage, and a PhD student in art history from the University of Valencia. She's a member of ICOM, the International Council for Museums, a specialist in communications and cultural management. She has worked as a press officer for fashion and art projects and as a cultural promoter for organizations such as the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, ICROM, and the National Office for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage, INA, in Mexico, where she also did audience research. So as you can see, we have a distinguished speakers, group of speakers today with us. And without further ado, I will also give the floor to Eda, our first speaker. Eda. Thank you very much. Uh, hello to everyone listening. I'm going to share my screen one moment. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Edda. I live on the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's uh, 9.30 p.m. Uh, in the evening where I am, but uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about my work in sustainable fashion. Sorry, I've just slid that over. There we go. Uh, one second. Here we go. Okay. I'm here to talk a little bit about my work in sustainable fashion. Uh, the approaches that I have taken to educating communities and commercializing sustainable fashion business model. Uh, my interest is in business and entrepreneurship, but how can we do this in a sustainable way? Uh, and sustainable fashion has been my focus for the last 10 years. I started researching sustainable fashion in 2010 when I was at university and decided that there was not enough being done to educate consumers on where their clothes are made. Who was making their clothes? What fibers their clothes were made of? There was not enough information and, and I felt that there was a generation of blind consumption. I wanted to do something about that. I started in 2011 with a fashion show that presented designers on the runway that produce collections ethically using eco-friendly fabrics uh, to show, or, or designers that were doing, taking steps to reduce their impact on the people and planet. The show was called Undress Runways. And the name is in the spirit of yes, undress and put something sustainable on, but also the idea of undressing your mind from mainstream culture, carving out your values and dressing according to your values. 
Undress is a movement that celebrates the progress and the positive stories in sustainable fashion. My team and I created an exciting space that 10 years ago ha had some stigma around it and, and often we would refer to it as a space where uh, it was for hippies, but but our goal is to break down the stigma and, and put sustainable fashion in a new light, a light that felt attractive to young people and a positive space where people could, they didn't have to do sustainable fashion perfectly because it was new. And looking back, I think that this was really important that the fact that Undress Runways was led by a group of naive, inexperienced people. It put us on the same level ground as our customers. We were still figuring out if leather or faux leather was sustainable. Was polyester sustainable? Is it okay to manufacture in China if the collection was made with bamboo fabric? All of these questions we were trying to figure out with our audience. And we were very optimistic about the future. Fast forward a few years, the image you see uh, is an image from one of our shows. But fast forward a few years, uh, we started to know what we were talking about. We started to feel the frustrations of misinformation in the fashion industry. And we started to feel that we couldn't just be celebrating the good stories. It was, it had to be more. We had to talk about the dark underbelly of the fashion industry. And that's when we decided to launch the Naked magazine. And it was in a way the opposite of Undress Runways. We allowed ourselves to be angry. We allowed ourselves to talk about child labor, pollution, consumerism, and everything that was holding the industry back. And then we would give this magazine to our guests and they could take it home and read some truth. The fashion industry isn't all positive stories and celebration. And for us, it was important to have that balance. Fast forward to 2016, we were starting to get jaded and frustrated with the lack of progress in the industry and we were fed up with fashion campaigns that presented sustainable collections. And when you look into it, there was not much sustainable about it. Driving consumerism veiled as sustainable living. This is still happening today. We call it greenwashing. And once again, we changed our approach. And this time we've decided to build an online marketplace for clothes sharing and renting. We built a platform and we got 100 young people to upload images of their clothes to our online platform to rent with their community. In theory, this is a great idea. Um, and together with my co-founder, we went and raised investment. We joined a creative technology accelerator program. We built a tech team and we created one of the first peer-to-peer -peer clothes sharing platforms in Australia and even one of the first in Europe. We were up against a lot of obstacles, including, including normalizing the idea of renting your clothes on the internet, uh, the logistics of transporting clothes around financially sound way, insurance for clothing that is being rented and lack of cash flow and investment. Um, I decided to be based out of Australia as it was cheaper to operate and the, it was an environment that I was familiar with. But finding fashion investors in Australia is a challenge, particularly for a concept that had not yet been proven. But I am encouraged to see a lot of clothes rental platforms emerging out of Europe and Australia still today. So the, the future is bright. At the end of the day, we decided to pivot our model and we focused on producing revenue rather than growth. In 2018, we decided to launch a maternity fashion label with pieces available for sale and for rent. My co-founder and I had never been pregnant, but we did a lot of research in this market and found that it was underserved when it came to stylish maternity clothing that was ethically manufactured. And it was also an excellent segment for the rental space. We designed some pieces. We learned a lot about the psychology of being pregnant, uh, mother's relationship with clothing. Pregnant women wanted to rent clothes, but they didn't want to put their own clothes on the internet for rent. They're also price sensitive due to the short-term nature of their changing body. 
So the following year, we brought Undress Runways back and expanded the concept to include a sustainable fashion conference. This was the conference of my dreams. We had uh, Maxine Bidet and Dominic Drakeford as our keynotes. Uh, we had heads of textile recycling in Australia speak. Um, we integrated the SDGs. We even had an Aboriginal Australian drag queen, fashion designers, climate warriors, and young people. And that was in 2019. And then 2020 came around and everything, of course, um, has been on pause. Uh, I'm not sure how much more time I have, but I, I would like to just leave with three small points. I've had a lot of learnings in the last 10 years, um, both about sustainable fashion and about running businesses in sustainable fashion. Um, but I, th I think there's, there's three things that, um, that wouldn't sum up my experience, but at the moment, this is, these are some of the things that I think are really important to think about for the future. Number one is the psychology of consumerism. I have a master's in marketing, yet I think fashion marketing is extremely dangerous. Fast fashion brands thrive on advertising. Um, we are all on their radar and they are doing such a good job that globally we consume about 80 billion new pieces of clothing every year, which is 400% more than we were consuming just two decades ago. Uh, this, the second point is, is I've written recycled polyester, but what I really want to get across is we need to scrutinize um, greenwashing and the different creative ways that brands put across um, their collections or fabrics and, and call it sustainable. It's very hard to be sustainable in its entirety. Um, I don't think sustainable fashion in a way is a bit of an, it is a bit of an oxymoron, but for example, with recycled polyester, fast fashion companies are the biggest producers of synthetic clothing, which sheds in microfibers into our oceans, making up 85% of human made materials found along ocean shores. And the emergence of recycled polyester may be better than virgin polyester for obvious re reasons, but it still sheds microplastics. So I think what we need to think when we see recycled polyester is one of the, the biggest trends at the moment. Um, it still has the problem of shedding microplastics. Um, if you are interested in, in reducing your microplastic shedding, you can purchase an, a product called a guppy friend, which you can put your clothes in before you wash them because it, it, the, the, a large um, it, footprint is during the washing phase. Um, and the final point that I want to leave you with, uh, which uh, for me is a, an exciting space. Uh, I've just started studying psychology and I'd like to um, take my psychology into the workplace and see how we can start creating change from the inside of organizations rather than uh, creating disruptive models from the outside. Um, but ethical leadership and collaboration with young people must be a priority for us. Electing courageous leaders who can put people and people and planet before profit, um, involving young people, funding young people. It's not enough to have a seat at the table. It's about we've got to put money where our mouth is to fund young people, to organize and research and explore and educate um, and start um, helping us build the future that, that they will live in and level the playing field. So thank you so much. I'd, um, I'd love to take questions at the end. Um, if there's anything that's come up, uh, I'm, would, I'm more than happy to take lots of questions. So thank you so much. Thank you, Eda. Interesting indeed. And even in our first presentation, we still have lots and, of ideas and thoughts, uh, new comments to make. So thank you so much. Okay, no so problem. I will now leave the floor to Tere, Tere Gonzalez. Oh, Eda, we need you to stop sharing your screen. Okay. Thank you, Jorge, and thank you, Eda. Uh, let me please share my screen.
Can you see it, hear me? Yes, perfect. And thank you so much. I won't talk about myself because Jorge did a better job than I could ever do at this time of the day. I want us to discuss a little bit about the sustainable development goals, a little crash course for those who are eating lunch and don't have them in front of you. For those who are about to go to sleep or waking up, it's always a good reminder because this is basically our task for the next years uh, until 2030. So a quick refresher, what is sustainable development? This means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This sounds simple. However, it is not simple because this calls for concerted efforts from many different actors, from many different sectors and industries, including the fashion industry, but includes governments, people like you and me, private sector, civil society. And there are three pillars. Well, four, because Jorge already told us about the fourth pillar, which I love and I will now include in all my presentations. But the first pillar of sustainable development is economic growth. This means growing at a rate that doesn't affect the ability of future generations to also grow. Take smart decisions today to enable future generations to live a better, a better life. Second, social inclusion. This means the image speaks by itself that everyone gets a piece of the cake, creating opportunities for all, uh, reducing inequalities, raising basic living, living standards. Third, environmental protection. This means promoting integrated and sustainable management of cultural resources and ecosystem. Fourth pillar, which I don't have an image for, cultural sustainability. Thank you, Jorge. And here are our goals. Uh, you might remember that in September 2015, 193 countries convened to agree on this agenda. Just imagine this titanic task. Um, we, this is our roadmap, our compass for 2030 to end poverty, to fight inequalities, but also to protect our planet and tackle climate change. These goals are amb ambitious. They're all interconnected, but I think when these were agreed upon, no one imagined a pandemic like the one we are living in would hit. And this has set definitely a deep, completely different reality, and we are facing major setbacks trying to make this progress. Even, I'm sad to say, because I've been an advocate for this since the very beginning, before the pandemic, progress was not happening fast enough. We were not on track. Now with the pandemic and the setbacks we are facing, we have a big, big challenge in front of us. Actually, the first ever global decline on SDG progress has been driven by the increased rates of poverty and unemployment related to COVID-19. So a bit of a dire scenario we're facing here. These goals are connected, as I mentioned, because they cut across social, economic, and environmental needs as you can see we have goal 13 for climate action we have no poverty goal number one or gender equality goal number five um we are able to achieve this only with a concerted effort as i mentioned before if governments private sector civil society and individuals don't work together we won't achieve this and the fashion industry and i already shared a few as well dire as statistics about how the fashion industry is working. For example, the industry generates about 10% of global carbon emissions. Here, we cannot only talk about climate action, but also the connection to other, other goals. We have right now a unique opportunity to guide our pandemic recovery efforts by the SDGs. And it is important to remember that the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action. There are five SDGs that I would like to zoom in on now because I believe they are important pieces of the puzzle of sustainable fashion. And I took the time to outline a few actions that I believe the fashion industry can take to address and contribute to the achievement of each one of these, of these goals. The fashion industry can play a key role during but also after the pandemic to help countries get back on track on SDG progress. This of course includes engaging with different stakeholders in the industry from 
raw material producers to textile producers, apparel manufacturers, and brands to identify areas of action that actually connect the entire value chain. So let me go quickly through this. I'm going to fly through them. So excuse me if I don't uh, go deep into each one of these, but I want to allow time for us to discuss further and more in detail later. But a few basic actions that we can ask and advocate for within the fashion industry are adhering to international labor standards at a minimum, stop the exploitation, the exploitation of workers in poorer countries, and stop taking advantage of great areas in taxation. This is a big issue now, and if you actually consult the uh, SDG progress report that just came out uh, in mid-June, you'll find more about this. Uh, assessing a slavery footprint in the company, taking action to eradicate it, obviously fair wages and dignifying working conditions are, ba are basic to eradicating poverty, as well as advocating for a univer universal basic income. What can the fashion industry do for gender equality? We know the pandemic has set us back many years in terms of gender equality, but we can start and continue working, closing gender gaps in terms of wages and access to leadership positions, supervisory roles in the production lines at the company, different company levels, uh, implementing flexible work schemes. The pandemic has proven that we can do this, that we can work from home. We can encourage both mothers, fathers, all parents to take leave and take an equal share of home responsibilities, providing support uh, to employees to take care of children, of elder uh, members of family, or any other care needs that could arise, and providing access to proper breastfeeding facilities creating inclusive supply chains that support women-owned businesses, but also businesses owned by other gender minorities, challenge gender roles. This point, I love it because if anything, the fashion industry is creative. And I think we have great opportunity here to move away from gender roles, gender stereotypes through our products, but also through operations and innovate intra-company as well as outside the company. A very important one that I, want not, I don't want to leave last or forgotten is collecting gender disaggregated data. The amount of things we can do when we collect data, analyze it and protect it properly is immense. And inter, an intersectional approach can really help us create solutions, services, products, and new approaches like EDA's project, for example, or a project like Silk Now can help can help us change the landscape. Let's move now to goal eight, decent work and economic growth. I'm leaving here a reminder of what we spoke about during goal one, to end poverty, because as I mentioned, these goals are connected. So some of the actions we have discussed in other goals can and definitely will influence actions in other, other goals. So in addition to what we discussed to end poverty, the adhering to international labor standards, stopping exploitation, I want to add a few more here. One is creating respectful workplaces. This means, for example, supporting sur survivors of gender-based violence, domestic and sexual violence, implementing the proper policies and mechanisms to report and eradicate abuse in the workplace. We know in factories, shifts can be extremely long, uh, line production, uh, different standards in different countries can make this difficult, but it is key that companies start making progress on this specific target. And I would like to talk more about it uh, later during our, our panel and uh, questions. Another point is providing access to well being, mental health resources for employees and their families, ensuring fair trade inclusive business, we spoke about women-owned businesses, gender minorities in business, and actually have inclusive supply chains. Engaging social justice issues as private sector, as companies, there is a big role advocating for these issues and actually dedicating resources to them inside and outside the company. 
I think this is key. And if anything, the past couple of years have taught us a lot about this. Goal 12, responsible consumption and production. First, I think there's an opportunity for the fashion industry to acknowledge the role that they have causing environmental and human harm, make public commitments with accountability mechanisms. Transitioning to sustainable fibers and materials, as I spoke a little about this, using responsibly natural resources and land and be accountable for that. Engage with consumers for better consumption habits. This relates to the next point, rethinking supply system, but also fostering circular actions. Uh, apologies, circular fashion models. That, mean, that could mean repurposing, that can mean renting, resale, and other forms of circular uh, fashion. Last but not least, obviously, climate action. We said that the fashion industry generates about 10% of global carbon emissions, is one of the world's biggest users of water, and produces around 20% of global wastewater. It takes only 10,000 liters of water to produce one kilo of cotton. This is to produce a single pair of denim jeans that we all wear every single, every single day. This is insane. <laughs> I don't find another world. This is not acceptable and we need to push the industry from outside, from inside, from designers to materials and manufacturers to cut greenhouse gas emissions by at least 30% by 2030. Transitioning to renewable energy sources, improving wastewater management, and also in all of this, investing in reversing or mitigating existing damage. This is key because there is already damage that has been done. What is happening next? Are we able to reverse it? Are we able to mitigate it? Are we able to adapt? And the industry has to take responsibility. We talked about acknowledging the harm that has been done. And this is where we start. Assessing overall environmental, the environmental footprint and taking action to reduce it. So assessing slavery footprint, assessing environmental footprint, take action for both. Advocating for climate policies and promote climate action. There are already hundreds of initiatives from industry or at the national level, or at the international level, and measures that companies can already join for climate action and climate justice. Finally, Eda highlighted as consumers, what can we do? And we have more power than we think. I wanted to suggest this resource to get started. Um, this is a survey that was designed to analyze the products that you consume, including those that are in your closet, as you can see here. And the survey analyzes the supply chains of over 400 products and looks into child labor and forced labor. So depending on the items that you have in your closet, the items that you have on your fridge on a regular basis, you can find out how many people working under forced labor or child labor are involved in the supply chains to sustain just your current lifestyle. This is obviously an invitation to reflect, to take action and make changes because individual power can really push companies that we engage with every single day to make a better world for all of us. So thank you. I'm going to leave it here and pass it over back to Jorge and let's discuss more in the next part of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tere. That was brilliant. And uh, now it's turn for Mar Margaitan. Hello. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tere and Reda. And I think it was quite amazing. And wow, oof. we have to reflect a lot on what we are wearing and what do we have in our closet. So let me share my screen. OK, so thank you for uh, the European School of Administration and, of course, the Instituto Cervantes of Brussels for having us today. 
And well, as we spoke about um, the SDGs, of course, I'm going to talk about the fourth pillar. <laughs> I'm going to talk about culture, which is my place and what I do for a living and what I love the most. So as Jorge said, I'm not going to <laughs> introduce myself, but I'm an art historian. So you might understand how I love so much culture. And uh, well, uh, why culture is important for the sustainable development goals because it's an interesting part of human beings. I mean, you can remember just right now when we were hit by COVID-19, how many um, our, our homes were full of culture. I mean, we watched operas, we watched, uh, I don't know, muse we went to museums from our houses and without leaving it. And I think the balconies were full of music and that's culture. And that's why it is so, so important to preserve it and to have it. And when including it in the agenda for sustainable development, that meant that the international community recognized the culture as a driver of sustainable development. There's no development and there's no sustainability without considering culture, without considering the fourth pillar. It's a resource, but it's also a transversal tool. And it is crucial to count with culture to achieve this transformation, to achieve these sustainable uh, development goals. And nevertheless, uh, we didn't include uh, culture per se as a, as a sustainable development goal. I mean, I think we have gender equality, we, we have, um, we have the, to build resilience, but we didn't have to um, a sustainable development goal that said like access to culture when it's a fundamental human right. Actually, it's written in the human rights definition. So why we didn't have this? So several global networks in the field of culture launched this um, culture in the beginning. It was the culture 2015 goal campaign, and it called for the inclusion for a specific goal on culture in the 2030 agenda. And because they, we or we all recognize that there is a gap in in this um, in the sustainable development goals that didn't include culture per se. So now this global campaign is called culture 2030 goal, and I invite you everyone to be part of this because I think we, or culture, cultural heritage should really be part of this agenda and it should be really addressed. So in, in, in any case, of course, uh, there, is, there are several ways that culture contributes, at least for the five Ps, you know, it's people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnership. I mean, I'm going to go really quick because I know that we all want to have a, a, fun, a debate and to go a little bit deeper. But for example, of course, uh, culture is the way we identify our, uh, ourselves to our community. We can protect the natural heritage and biodiversity because as you might know, culture, uh, heritage is not only cultural heritage, it's also natural and, and uh, natural heritage. Of course, it can drive uh, peace between nations and it can be, and it should be safeguarded. This is show just a, a quick example. And um, I'm going to focus, of course, on cultural heritage. It's, again, this is my, my field and what I love. And we cultural heritage professionals are in charge of protecting, studying, conserving, and disseminating uh, heritage. But what is heritage? I mean, we can be speaking here uh, a lot of what we understand by heritage. I mean, this is a long, long, long discussion, but like, in quick words, we can say that it's, of course, not about money, it's not about property, it's about culture, it's about values, it's about traditions. It implies both, it impl implies a bond, it's our belonging to our community, it's how we acknowledge that we belong to somewhere and we belong here uh, to a community. Um, but it's also, it represents our history, our identity, it's our bond to the past, to the present, but of course, is the road to the future. It's not only about tangible aspects it's not about architecture or about paintings it's not about it's not a mona lisa only but it's also about intangible traditions it's about oral history it's about dance it's about music it's about craftsmanship and this is something that we are uh, i want to talk about a little bit uh, later and that's why this is so important and i think and again i think and that we should raise our voices and say like hey culture is important let's advocate for it and just a, a few, a quick example in the general uh, world. I think that we all remember what happened in, in Timbuktu in, in Mali that many mausoleums and the archives uh, were destroyed. And it was the first time in history that the International Criminal Court said that this was a crime against humanity. And this is huge. 
because it was the first time in, in history that say, hey, cultural heritage should and must be respected because it's part of, of ourselves. It's not my heritage, it's our heritage in, in, in this regard. I think that you also might remember when Khaled al-Assad, uh, an archaeologist in Syria, he, he was murdered because he was protecting not his heritage, our heritage, because he was protecting what belongs to humankind. And again, I think that's why this is again so, so important to protect this fourth pillar and to advocate for it. And this is another example because heritage collection under conservation, of course, have uh, a key role to play in sustainable de development. And I'm going to talk about here really quickly, and this is a program that it's led by ICROM, the International Conservation Institute that it's in charge of uh, conserving and disseminating cultural heritage around the world. And of course, the University of Valencia and now is part of this program. And what they are trying to do is to unlock the potential of uh, cultural heritage collections. It's not about anymore about conserve, conserve. It's why are we conserving these cultural assets? To whom are we conserving it and why are we conserving it? It's to recognize the potential of heritage collection, it's to change mindset, it's to engage communities, but because without our community, we are no one. We have to raise awareness, raise education, and to involve the general audience, the researchers, the professionals, leave no one behind, and to provide practical means to train and to really transform uh, our society. And then through cultural heritage, we can actually go and achieve sustainable development. We can involve creative industries. I mean, we can think how museums can be a little bit greener. Their buildings, I mean, do you know how much <laughs> it's expensive, the, the air conditioner, for example. This is just a, 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 a quick example, or the chemicals we use when we restore uh, a cultural assets. So these are many, many ways that we can think in sustainable development, and this is going to and now currently I invite you to go to their website and they are providing a toolkit for everyone that wants to have access to it. And currently, and, and I'm going to do, as we are in Silk now, and this is <laughs> what we're, we're doing. Well, I know that many of you or some of you have already been in, in our last talk, so I'm not going to say why is Silk now, but in generally, uh, we're a European H2020 funded project. We are six partners from nine countries, including Spain, Germany, France, Slovenia, Poland, and Italy. Uh, we are weavers, we are artisans, we are 3D printers, we are art historians, philologists, and computer scientists, so many disciplines. And we are all together united to preserve the important European silk heritage. And if you're wondering why it's important to preserve it, because, I mean, uh, I think Gonzalo said in the beginning, because European history is women in silk, it's not about luxury, goods, but it's also about tradition. In, in the image, you can see a, a fallera, which is a, tradi a traditional in the cloth here in, in Valencia, but also it's about preserving historical and artisanal fabrics. And it is also about technology. I don't know if you were aware that the Jacquard loom is the direct ancestor of the modern computers. <laughs> and this is huge. So we are in charge of protecting it. And as today's talk, it's about creative industries and fashion, and I'm going to focus on that. And here in Silk Now, we worked with, um, with industries, with especially with uh, traditional industries that are still weaving with jacquard looms for over 200 years. And for example, for them, we provided with a tool that is called the virtual loom that acts as a digital memory that allows them to weave without actually uh, weaving. Let's say it's a, it's a computer where you can put your design and change the jars, change the colors. And this is, this is quite important for them if, because you, you have to imagine that this is quite artisanal and it takes a, lo a lot of time and a lot of money to weave just a little a piece of fabric. So with a virtual loom, this can be really, quicker and, and cheaper, but also it can spark creativity because it can also act for, a, a, you know, for a designers or for, art, uh, for artists that they can upload whatever they want and they can weave it. I mean, you can weave, you can try to weave your, your own dog, for example, I did it. So just imagine how, how important it is. Uh, but we also worked with design schools because we understand that sustainable development and sustainability is not only about uh, the, the craftsmanship, but it's also to involving, as I said before, and to engage young people, the younger generations, because they have to understand how important heritage is and what's the role in and what is going to be their role, as Eda said, in the future fashion world. So in this case, we also 
and this is something historically, um, design schools were involved in the silk tradition designs. And we wanted to, to keep this tradition alive. So we went to the uh, design schools and show them why, what was silk, what was important, their designs. And they made amazing designs. And for example, uh, at the left, you can see uh, someone, uh, uh, she was a student that she recreated the Eleonor de Toledo painting that was painted by Bronzino in the Renaissance. So you can see how amazing it was and uh, the incredible work she did. But we also uh, have like, okay, this is silk. Uh, you can do whatever you want. And they use recycled uh, uh, silk um, or soak sort of silk things to recreate or to create something completely new. And we did a catwalk in a museum. So it was always, we were always trying to connect uh, sustainability, uh, creativity, uh, heritage, and technology. So we always try to work with that. And of course, if we're, today we're talking about fashion. It's, uh, we absolutely have to say that we did an editorial with, uh, with professional models. And we asked uh, professional designers such as Francis Montesinos to let us use some of their designs. And we went to Garin. Garin is one of our, main, uh, our partners. And they, they are still weaving with, with Jacarlums. So we try to connect the, uh, the craftsmanship with the modern industry. So we, cre we created this kind of uh, editorial. But um, this is with, with it I'm going to, to finish. Um, we also did uh, this uh, fashion design. And this is what quite important because we contacted with a fashion designer called uh, Patrick Wojcinowski. He's a Polish designer, a well-known Polish designer. And we told him that we, want, we wanted him to create a Silk Now collection. And, but he had to be inspired by uh, silk and silk designs. So he connected with Garin, this uh, traditional factory, but he also connected to another of our partners who is called Monkey Faf, and they are specialized in 3D printing. So the three of them talked together and they created, and um, Patrick, uh, he created these amazing designs. Some of them are inspired in traditional silk designs, and some other are inspired in women techniques, such as the Moiré, for example. And those are printed in bioplastics because we didn't want to print in any plastic. We didn't want to pollute, and but we wanted to experiment with 3D printing because maybe, and Eda should know better than than I do. Maybe it's kind of future for the fashion industry. I'm not saying that it's going to be tomorrow, but probably at some point we are, we are going to introduce uh, this 3D printing and we wanted to experiment with this. So uh, this was the, the result. Unfortunately, we couldn't have a huge event due to COVID, but we did a short uh, event in the Instituto of Brusela, in the Instituto Cervantes de Varsovia, in Warsaw, in Poland. And uh, it also was a very performative act because we involved violinists, dancers, sculptors, because we always want to think, okay, like silk is the past, but it's also the present and the future. And it's, so, it's not only about the tangible fabrics, but it's also about the intangibility of, of the skills, of the designs, and also it's about literature and music. I think last week we had a round table about music and literature and art. So silk is like a lot of things info that can be part of the fashion industry. And um, that we asked them like, what, what do you think about this experiment? And it's, it was quite positive because uh, Patrick Wojcinowski, the fashion designer, he said, okay, uh, he told me, like, it's quite important to, for us, to designers, to have um, a place to look, to, to get inspired. And that's one of the, another result. In Silk Now, we created an um, exploratory search engine that is, uh, that is called Ada Silk. And it's called Ada because it's in honor to Ada Lovelace, the first woman programmer. So again, we wanted to also uh, acknowledge women and gender and gender equality. Uh, not only for the women that had, have weaved along the history, but also we want to involve women in STEM and of course in humanities, but also in STEM. And he said like uh, this repertory as a silk is amazing. And I like to reconnect and to connect and with my history and my tradition because I can learn new techniques or relearn 
techniques that were already forgotten. And Elena, for example, from Garin, she said like, and I love this part, like we are keepers of the intangible and tangible heritage. I love that part because she is a traditional uh, industry, uh, traditional weaving industry, and she considers herself as a keeper of heritage. And, and I think that it, it's really amazing to have a creative industry that acknowledges herself as a keeper of, of heritage. And uh, she also said that she, she's supporting uh, these traditional industries and then hence she's promoting sustainable development. And finally, Pavel Tardo, um, the CEO of Monkey Fab, he said like, okay, this is something that it's on the long road, but I think 3D printing can be part of the fashion industry. So as you, as you can know, um, culture, and I want to end with this, culture is quite important, is the fourth pillar, and it should be part, and I think it should be part of as SDGs, not only as a football, but to have a specific goal itself, to have access. Everyone should have access to culture and cultural heritage. And I thank you all. And if you have any questions, anything, please follow us. Of course, uh, here is you have our, our website. You can talk to us in this email or Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. So thank you so much. And let's open the room to other okay. questions. OK, Mark, thank you very much. And congratulations. Good. So I guess we still have um about maybe 20 or 30 minutes uh, for, a, for an open conversation. And let me, uh, well, again, first of all, express my gratitude to all our speakers for such inspiring and illuminating talks. And definitely lots of things to talk about today. Uh, let me just remind all our audience that uh, for questions, uh, please use the Q&A box because I see some questions and comments in the chat which is just supposed to be for technical questions. But I mean, we, we can do that. But I mean, just uh, for the sake of procedure keeping, uh, please use the Q&A. Otherwise, let me just uh, begin with, uh, with an initial question. And in, in a way, of course, this goes for, for all of them, but probably for, for Eda, our first speaker. Uh, lots of interesting ideas and uh, examples in your talk. Uh, let me ask you about, um, well, individual creators, individual, in, in this case, designers, fashion designers, what do you think are their, your responsibilities in promoting a more sustainable approach to fashion? What could you maybe just let us know about some specific examples or inspiring ideas in how design uh, can uh, move towards, can move fashion towards sustainability? Yes, definitely. Uh... I think it's important to appreciate the garment life cycle when thinking about sustainable fashion. So the garment life cycle um, is, is, the, is this life cycle of, for example, a dress. And we start with the textile, where it is grown, uh, then it goes into production. This may be in a different country, uh, the design process. This also could be in a different country. Uh, we have the production and the assembly of, of the item, the distribution, the retail, the use phase, and then it can either be re-entered into the cycle or it ends up in, um, in landfill or, as they say, the grave. Uh, in terms of, from a design perspective uh, and, and through my experience, uh, it's very challenging to, to tackle everything at once. A lot of designers will start with a fiber or start with a design process or start with a solar powered factory, for example, or start with, um, you know, from a, a consump consumption perspective to buy locally made to reduce the carbon footprint. So I think when it comes to sustainable production, it's about prioritizing where you want to begin um, in terms of achieving that sustainability and, and, and to be specific, it's challenging again within, for example, a fiber. Um, there's a big debate, is bamboo more sustainable than cotton? Um, and, and bamboo uses a lot of chemicals in terms of the process to take it from bamboo into a fiber. And those chemicals, um, that it's not a closed loop system. So there's debates around that bamboo is not sustainable and cotton takes up a lot of water. Um, so 
cotton is a, a highly int intensive water crop. So you have to weigh up all of these different fibers and it's a very challenging um, landscape to, to navigate when it comes to fiber. I think something that's more um, uh, an interesting concept for the future in terms of sustainable design is the circular economy and the idea to design something that lasts. So not designing to be worn for a short period and then it will either break, but to actually either design for longevity, design for disassembly, which means that it can be um, taken apart and recreated into something new, um, and, and taking responsibility for a product beyond the checkout. I think this is an interesting concept that, that um, whether it is offering repairs, free repairs for clothing for customers to bring it back and, and have it repaired, or whether it, there's a collection system that is facilitated by the designer or the brand, but this, this thinking of I'm going to look after this product beyond when it leaves my site, and I'm going to make sure that it doesn't end up somewhere which, where, where it will, might hurt the environment. Right. And Jorge, if may I, but oh, I think also sure. design, it should also be considered, I mean, from the historical heritage point of view, and uh, and also to, to acknowledge, and not only the historical point of view, but also from the indigenous culture and the indigenous rights. I think, um, and you might know, uh, fashion, how many fast fashion designers have uh, taken uh, Aboriginal or indigenous designs without acknowledge them, and uh, we have a and I I don't know if you remember we had a, a talk with a museum from from Oaxaca and he was saying like okay we don't want your money but we want only to being acknowledged that this is our design and this is our heritage and this is our identity. So I think that's also quite important from the design point of view. You know, not not only as you were saying like. Uh, reusing it, but how are we going to reuse it and who are we supporting with our reuse or not? So this is something that I think we should also take into account when we're talking about design. Mark and Jorge, if I may jump in here, this is also something I feel really strongly about, cultural appropriation in the fashion industry. It is really sad to see that the designs, the patterns that we grew up surrounded by from indigenous communities in Mexico end up being sold for a dollar at H&M and you have it on a t-shirt and the end consumer doesn't even know where that came from, at least some responsibility to acknowledge the initial design, to pay fairly to the original <laughs> creators of this design but also there's a responsibility to bring that history along with the product and tell the final consumer like, hey, this cool t-shirt that you're buying for a dollar in the Christmas sale has a story. This pattern comes from ancestors in Oaxaca and this actually means honoring uh, pre-Hispanic gods in this way and this way. And it doesn't have to be a a long uh, tag, but perhaps a little sustainable tag that you can plant later on at home that has four or three lines telling a history in a, in a different way. This means also acknowledging dynamics of oppression and privilege along the, the chain. Um, I wanted also to bring up a point we tend to think very linear and perhaps it is time to bring that circular concept also to our roles in the chain as consumers, as designers, as manufacturers. Just because you are a designer doesn't mean you cannot ask about childcare benefits of the women or men that are going to be producing your pieces in a factory. Just because you are a manufacturer, that doesn't mean you just produce without looking anything else around you. It means you can ask, hey, is this pattern, where does it come from? Like integrating more and communicating more between the pieces of this chain that produce a final, a final product. This includes the consumers, because as consumers, we can also produce knowledge. If perhaps a brand, I won't keep naming specific brands, but if, this brand 
didn't do their, their job and their homework. As a consumer, I could still buy the piece, but do my homework online. We are hyper-connected right now. Why not uh, join and compare a few pieces of clothing and talk about them? Where did they come from? If we don't know, let's compare notes and find out together. It could be a, I don't know, maybe this is very nerdy of me, but a very exciting uh, scavenger hunt online to see where our pieces are, the things we're wearing every day come from. Yeah, and but I also think that our, our role as consumers, as you were saying, because uh, I don't know, it probably happens in, in everywhere, but at, here in Mexico, you go and when you buy directly to indigenous communities, it's quite often often from our ourselves as pre privileged people to say like, but okay, it costs how much? How much does it cost? Uh, can you give it cheaper, please? And it's quite common. And it's like, no, this has a story and these people have worked a lot to do that. Don't ask them like, ah, can you keep selling me cheaper? No. And it's it also happens here. I think um, when we talk here in Valencia with the silk industry, the traditional silk industry, it's like, okay, this is, this is expensive, but it takes a lot of time for us to weave traditionally weave. Of course, it's cheaper to just, you know, <laughs> sell it and the fast consumption, but let's protect uh, either the indigenous communities and the traditional silk uh, weavers and the traditional artisans that are, and I think it is a role as consumers also to, to take a look at what we are buying. Yeah, I think there is a really strong um, sort of financial thread in this in terms of fashion being an investment. And I think that what is really driving this fast fashion world is the low price point. And how can we like what are some good messages to um for designers and for cut for consumers to be able to embrace um that gets around this this drive for the cheap price and and one thing that i um have thought a lot about is in terms of when when people say how how do i shop sustainably um but i don't have a lot of money uh, and i i often say that it's about paying double and shopping half as often so it's about this like financial approach which is you're saving money to be able to invest um, and you're not it's not more expensive you're just buying half as often but you're paying double so you can truly invest that's a very good point Teda. Okay, so uh, I still have some things and any questions to make, but since we have a lot of questions from the from the audience, let me just go to them at this moment. And uh, the first two of them, I guess they are quite similar among them, and uh, all of you could talk about them, but probably Eda should be first. Uh, Benedict is asking, can we one day get independent from China? This is like a you know very open <laughs> and clear question. And I was saying it's pretty much not only, but it could be related to the next question. So I guess that both can be answered in, in a single in a single uh, answer. And from Panagiotis, are sustainable fashion items and low prices compatible? So again, we can we go back to the prices discussion that we were just having. But maybe I don't know if the, the reference. I mean, I guess it's the elephant in the room, China. But of course, uh, we can we can go about it. So, what do you think, uh, Eda, about this? You know, intertwined uh, situation. You know, with a global uh, exchange and global trade, particularly with China and uh, price pricing. Yes, I. Th uh... I think in terms of low prices and sustainable fashion, I think it's um, it's complex and layered because I, no virgin products, it is not possible to manufacture virgin products that we see in some of these fast fashion stores for those prices um, that are manufactured ethically. Um, but I think in terms of the definition of sustainable fashion, it doesn't have to be a virgin product, which I'm, I'm getting away from the question here, but I think we have to look at sustainable fashion as not only new products. Sustainable fashion is, is more than buying and going shopping. It's, it's, it's reusing, it's buying secondhand products. It's 
being creative, it's upcycling, it's borrowing, it's renting. There's so much more under that sustainable fashion umbrella, which um, doesn't answer the, the China question. But um, I think that we, we can access sustainable fashion in a, um, in a low, in, in a low price point. Um, but I mean, I've started two labels and I've done the maths and there is no way for a small designer to be able to compete with fast fashion. It's completely not possible. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. And then we also have another question very, very much uh, the openly directed to you, Hera, and uh, it's in the Q&A, but let me just read it aloud. How do you comment the study published by the Finnish scientific journal that basically concludes that renting clothes is less green than throwing them away due to environmental impact of dry cleaning, transportation, etc., associated with renting clothes? And there is a link to the study, which you probably know. But, um, Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for this question. And it's it's right. It's um the carbon footprint of transporting rental clothes is enormous as well as the dry cleaning and that's another reason why i think there's some really big challenges in the rental space the way that it can work is for high price items to access infrequently but there is a there is a shift in the rental space which is going towards more casual clothing work clothing and i think when we start to drift into this casual frequent wear space this is where the carbon footprint really increases because if you think about something that you wear to work you may actually wear it two or three times um, but when when we're renting we're reducing our wares and we're we're dry cleaning and transporting clothes far more often than we would ordinarily. So I think that there are some really big challenges in making the rental space work. But I do think for higher priced um, event, you know, a ball gown, I think that's where uh, it can, it plays a part in the bigger picture of options for sustainable fashion. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next question from Martin. Uh, I wonder, maybe, maybe we may not be the most appropriate uh, group to answer that, but if anybody feels free to, if anybody feels like answering, what about European legislation in the field? On the other one, on the other hand, this is a huge question because I'm sure that we, there is European legislation on many different, on the many different players that are parts of all this uh, business of all this sector, but I wonder if many, if any of you want to give any comments on the issue of European legislation. It's probably not our most... I'm afraid that it's not our field. And not our background. <laughs> no, uh, it's not. But in any case, we know that the European Union acknowledges and want to include and recognizes uh, the fashion industry as one of the most important industries in, in the creative industries, but I don't know how they are legislating it. So. No. Okay. On the other hand, Martin makes another question, and this is definitely one that I think we can answer from a shared perspective, from our shared perspectives. It includes definitely culture. It's an interesting question. Isn't it typical for fashion that it changes regularly? Should fashion change every year? What do you think? I can answer historically. Actually, uh, fashion began to change uh, in France, actually, because they were the most uh, skilled weavers. And they discovered that if they changed the fashion fast, they could produce more and they could sell more. And that's, the, that's how fast fashion and how the uh, oct uh, mid-October fashion started and mid-spring uh, fashion began. It was actually in Lyon, it was actually in France historically in the, during the 18th century. And the, yes, historically fashion actually changes and evolves and also comebacks actually. And um, this is quite important. I think um, for us it's sometimes complicated uh, to discover, okay, if this design comes from the, it's from the 19th or the, I don't know, I'm going to say something that it's probably from the 17th century because as you know, uh, we always have revivals in our history. And of course, fashion changes and of course, fashion recovers. And for example, it's a quite common thing 
I'm going to speak from, from the silk perspective. And we have a quite common uh, motif that is a pomegranate. And it has evolved so many, many times that at some point you don't see a pomegranate, but you see a pineapple. And this is something quite, I don't know, funny, let's, let's say, but it's quite important and actually acknowledges how fashion and how tradition changes and how important it is also for fashion designers and for designers in general, how they are always trying to come back to their designs. I know that um, here in Valencia, the silk uh, industries, they always uh, come back to the fashion designs. They have a, a lot of art history books and designs and actually, and this is something I'm going to sell again at a silk, it's open for, for designers. And they always go back and search for inspiration and yeah, fashion changes. Oh, good. So, uh, yep. Yeah. Well, we have new new questions coming in. Is there uh, from Joanna? Um, is there a user friendly app or tool or website or whatever that can help the customer make a conscious choice as for a piece of clothing that they are about to buy? Uh, one of the examples uh, that Ma Tere showed is, was uh, exactly this: this is slavery footprint. But I wonder if there are any other interesting resources or examples that you may want to share in this, you know, again, the hyper-connected uh, time that we live in is providing any leads or any tools that anyone can use when trying to make uh, shopping decisions in this regard. I would recommend a website and they have an app called Good On You. Uh, this is an Australian startup but they do rate global brands so good on you is the name of that great thank you very much and um okay so uh, from paula mm, uh, the concept of cheap and low quality per apporté mm, could it be addressed in this context you know also or in a similar way educating the cust the consumer to buy higher quality that might be cultural artisanal technical it could be the design the fabric could that higher quality buying might be a, a concrete way to reach and impact and make an impact in consumer behavioral patterns i guess it definitely yeah marketing and psychology uh, that definitely play a, a great role in, in, in this discussion in how to make, in, in one of the questions in the chat, there was also this comment on how to make it cool. I would add without risking um, and, and be, being really uh, careful about the risk of greenwashing. So, or, you know, this, this balance between posing, uh, making these things for the gallery and uh, a, 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 Via V or you know versus reaching uh, real impact. So, what would be your recommendations in terms of you know getting really uh, impact and change, and not just you know some outward appearances? Any any comments on this? I can uh, I can put some two cents in. Um, I saw the comment in the chat and I absolutely agree with marketing uh, being a powerful tool to uh, promote anti-consumerism or reduce consumerism. And essentially, this is something that I, that I did with my businesses, um, with the magazine, with the event, with our social media pages. It was a tool of marketing. The, the obstacle that I hit and I wonder how many more people will hit is who pays for the marketing um, and when you're up against these giants like H&M that are very good at um, making things look cool uh, it, it's it's it absolutely has a place and I think everything will make a difference uh, but I don't know I don't know if I'm convinced that marketing we can market ourselves out of the mess that we marketed ourselves into in the first place i i think it's a it's going to be 
um, a multi-channel, multi-layered approach. And I, I really think that the, the, the government needs to come in and there needs to be laws around protecting garment workers, protecting supply chains. There is a modern slavery act um, in Australia. It is um, voluntary to take part. So there needs to be some more legislation where um, people are essentially penalized for doing the wrong thing or, you know, or, or rewarded for doing the right thing. I, I'm not an expert on, on government legislation, but I think that it has come to the point that we do need the government to start stepping in and um, and kind of taking the pressure off the grassroots movement. Uh, if I may, in that sense, I wanted to recommend for our audience and speakers if they don't know about it yet. Uh, there's this initiative uh, run, run by the ILO the International Labor Organization and IFC, the International Finance Corporation, part of the World Bank Group. The initiative is called Better Work, Better Work. And it works with factories, uh, with government companies in uh, nine countries, including, for example, Bangladesh, Egypt, Jordan, Vietnam, Nicaragua, and impacts the work of 2.4 million workers they look at contracts, they look at gender, closing gender gaps within the companies, uh, providing the tools for women to access to supervisory roles, to have career development, to actually reach leadership positions within the different companies. It looks at issues, for example, like childcare. Uh, speaking about Vietnam, I was looking at the numbers earlier this week and women put 207 working days per year on unpaid care work. That's just in Vietnam. And I'm bringing this country up in particular because the garment uh, factory uh, market there is huge. The production of garments that come out of Vietnam and go to the rest of the world, Europe included, is immense. So it, I thought it would be interesting to look at this to look at better work as a positive example of international cooperation and how a country like Cambodia can share lessons with Egypt, for example, around what they are doing to protect employees in many different areas concerning um, labor labor rights. I thought it is it was a super interesting initiative. So look at it if you are curious about it. Thank you so much. So on the one hand, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that we still have questions coming, uh, but at the same time, uh, I'm sorry to say, but at some point we should stop this talk <laughs> and follow on with our, our ordinary lives. So, uh, but uh, let me just, um, uh, let me just, yeah, make a final question because it's been waiting for some time now from Desislava or I guess this is for Eda. Since the existing garments are to a big extent containing polyester and other microplastic creating fibers, how do you see the chances of a notion for compulsory building in of microplastics filter into washing machines? Is that an option really? Yeah, uh, yes, I think so, absolutely. I think that uh, I believe there is a brand that has started doing it. And I'm sorry, I don't know the brand, but absolutely, this is something that could be legislated um, to, to really protect our oceans. Great, thank you so much. Okay, then now being almost uh, 2.30, at least in Central European time, uh, I guess we should call it a day. And um, I've been asked by, Gonzalo from Instituto Cervantes in Brussels to give our well, his, his farewell and his uh, thank you note for all the speakers and also for all our audience. And certainly for, for us from the Silk Now project and here in University of Valencia, we're, we're, we're very happy with to have listened to you, been able to listen to you today. We have learned a lot, we have enjoyed a lot. 
and let's keep the good work going. I mean, there are lots of thing, interesting things happening, and I see that the, the, the audience is also enthusiastic. So uh, definitely uh, cheers and, and thanks to everyone. I wonder if whether from on the side of the European School of Administration, is there anything that you would like to add at this moment? Very quickly then, just to thank you, Jorge, to thank you, Mar, Tere, to thank you, Eda, for sharing with us your, not only your knowledge, but also your enthusiasm and dedication to a just cause. So thank you very much, and we hope that we will uh, see each other again um, at another occasion. Uh, enjoy your afternoon or your morning if you are in the States or your, if you, your evening if you are in Australia. And uh, see you very soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. And bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Eda. Great seeing you again in these yes. adventures. Same, Mar. Yes.